This is a, a, a child from about a year ago um, who presented at term with a very large head transfer from another facility. And at 24 weeks, he had a fetal ultrasound that showed cerebral ventricular megaly, but his parents did not want to undergo any additional testing. Um, so they continued the pregnancy was otherwise uneventful. He was delivered at term by cesarean section and transferred to our facility. His OFC was 50 centimeters. You can see where that falls on his growth chart here. His fontanelle was rounded and full. You can see the just a large degree of cephalocranial disproportion. His, his, his head, the vault, was much, so much bigger than the face. And this was before we got started here. We took the, uh, a spare cable from one of the endoscopes and hooked it up to a headlamp, and you can see that we dim the lights, the severe degree of um, hydrocephalus with the transillumination of the CSF through the scalp. His exam was otherwise unremarkable. This was his imaging. So you can see this clearly malformed cerebrum, a very thin mantle posteriorly. In these cases, I prefer to put a frontal shunt in if I'm going to put a shunt in because there's a little bit of a gasket. It doesn't make a great seal around the catheter, but at least there's some tissue as opposed to back here where there's very little and you can wind up with a, a CSF ulma around the uh, ventricular catheter. And here's an important thing though. So in terms of deciding what, what type of treatment you know, what, what are the options here? So the shunt obviously is an option. Um, but in terms of third ventriculostomy, he clearly has aqueductal stenosis. His fourth ventricle is tiny. Um, but look at his prepontine cistern. It's, it's almost non-existent. And it's just because of the severe degree of ventricular angling, the brainstem is really pushed forward. So I think in my experience, it would be almost difficult to get <clears throat> an ETV in there. But he's also a newborn, so that also... Mm -hmm raises some concern. So in terms of his ETV success score, if you do, do the math, it's a 40%. So he's a month old, no points. He's got aqueductal stenosis, 30 points, and no prior shunt, 10 points. So 40%. But I, I think, you know, again, most kids, it's about a 50% failure rate in, in kids under 60 or six months of age. So um, I don't think that this is, uh, this should be 10 points here, sorry. Zero points for that, sorry. 30 points and 10 points for no previous shot. So in combination with his age and this anatomic concern about the prepontine cistern, we placed a ventricular peritoneal shunt. It's possible that in the future, if he came back and, and malfunctioned, we could consider an ETV at that time. This was uh, the surgery here. That's just, the, again, the preliminary prep before we covered him up. But here's my skip incision here to get it down to the abdom abdominal cavity and the right frontal shunt. This is his uh, scan, probably about 11 months of age. He came into the ER for suspected malfunction, which was okay. Here's his imaging. So you can see the shunt traveling down and then large amount of catheter within the peritoneum. Here's his growth chart, so he's doing well. He's clearly got some developmental issues and he was later diagnosed uh, with the L1 cam hydrocephalus. So he has uh, the, the G mutation. So he has X-linked hydrocephalus, which is the cause of in general hydrocephalus in about 10% of boys. And here's his, here's his scan. So again, significant cerebral this genesis, just an abnormal looking brain, but his hydrocephalus is well, well controlled. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.